Hello and welcome to TC Lesson 1, Part A, with Dr. Ken. So this lesson is about introducing you generally to the electrotechnology industry. We're going to look at legislation around WHS and some environmental issues. The way we're going to do this is we're going to use sections out of the textbook 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, and it would be very helpful for you to have that textbook as we work through the slides. So the electrotechnology industry itself. The industry can be roughly divided into two groups, electrical and electronics. So those working in the area of electrotechnology industry need to know the principles of electricity. Basically, that's everybody in electrical or electronics. Electricity is provided by generating sources and is supplied by way of overhead and underground cables. You've all seen, I'm sure, very large towers to just small poles with cables on them. For above ground and, of course, underground, you won't see at all. ESI stands for the electrical supply industry, and that's an abbreviation for the people who do the generating and the distributing of our power. So electric power distribution. Let's have a close look at this diagram. If you give me a moment, I'll just turn on my screen pointer pen. There we go. And we're going to start over here with generators. So generators could be coal-fired steam generators, it could be solar, it could be hydro, it could be wind. So there are lots and lots of ways to generate electricity. And typically those generating plants generate at about 15 to 20,000 volts. Then as they come out of the generation plant, they have a step up transformer. So we step the voltage up through a transformer and we typically step it up to 132 kV or quite often 330 kV and we transmit it through those large towers that uh, you see dotted across the landscape to large distribution trans distribution substations. Now you can tell the distribution substation, the insulator columns that you can see that looks like stacks of big porcelain plates are often five, six, seven meters tall, very tall plates. You often see big aluminium rings, they're called corona rings to help with very high voltage discharge. So it's very easy to see a transmission substation, they're very large affairs. Then from there, we're going to come down this path here and we distribute to zone substations and we often do that at 33, 66 kV and sometimes even 132 to get us to these zone substations where the voltage is again reduced through transformers and things the like and comes along the tops of poles and you can see here there's another transformer here I just use the abbreviation TX is the abbreviation we use for transformers and it's broken the voltage down to about 230 volt single phase to supply these houses, which we would call domestic. And I'll just abbreviate that to DOM. Also, you can see coming down here through another transformer. So here, another larger transformer supplying 400 volts into a commercial building. Now coming down the far right hand arm we come down to another substation another zone substation again largest transformers and here we're distributing out at 22 kV so often can doesn't have to be 22 it can be 11 kV but often it's 22 or 11 so here at this substation we have say 11 kV coming in and then the factory reduces it to the voltage that it wants it so it takes care of its own transformers and 
inside our zone substation so back here at our zone substation we also drop it down to 11 kV down through some more transformers giving us 400 volts three phase and 230 volts single phase into domestic installations again so just to recap we have generators generating at 15 to 20,000 volts we push that up into much higher voltages to transmit over long distances so these distances are, are typically you know 200 kilometers plus they could be 200 kilometers they could be 2,000 kilometers so for very long distribution very high voltages and we keep it at those high voltages so we can keep our current low and keep our losses low then into our transmission substations where we break the voltages down into smaller voltage types we distribute that out into zone substations and then we go out to industry and commerce and domestic installations from our zone substations so that gives you some idea of how we reticulate electricity so the electricity industry is the supply industry is covers the generators the transmission the distribution or the ESI we go out into industrial installations maintaining electrical machinery electrical wiring and factories and larger industrial complexes and then we have commercial and domestic so installation of wiring like light power data and appliances commercial might be things like bakeries or even small factories might be seen as commercial and domestic obviously is people's houses homes apartment blocks those kinds of things so next is our electronics industry and the electronics industry includes data and voice communications radio TV transmissions communication systems and a lot of that is often done with optical fiber these days so we have consumer electronics that's the maintenance of domestic electronic appliances things like TVs um, inverter air conditioner systems your own computer itself would be seen as a domestic electronic appliance we have commercial electronics so repairing and servicing electronic equipment uh, mostly this is things like photocopier large computer server systems those kinds of things for commercial it also includes computer systems so installation service and repair whether it's something that's small and domestic or larger for commercial installations industrial so there's a lot of industrial electronic systems we call these PLCs or programmable logic controllers so a lot of industrial control systems use a lot of industrial electronics security of course plays a large part of industrial electronics these days be it uh, security systems for monitoring entry and exit and video systems so our electronics industry basically um, here are some pictures that kind of give you some idea so we have things like a TV for your appliances if you didn't recognize that as immediately as a TV I'll label it for you um, computers and of course lots of us have um, desktop computers but we might also these days have tablets tablets of course security systems play a large role and you can see here someone working on some industrial electronic computers and then finally well almost finally we have commercial things like photocopiers a lot of electronics repair done there and then as you uh, drive through the countryside these these days often you see on tops of large hills are telecommunications towers which have uh, antenna on the uh, tops of these things 
for uh, for phone is the big one at the moment so we're doing lots of phone and of course our phone systems at the moment are on what we call 4G but uh, 5G is coming also on top of these things we will have TV transmitters and radio also you'll see these dish like devices these are microwave links they're a cheap way of sending a lot of data they're digital they can send a lot of data over a microwave link direct line of sight tower to tower so it's a very cheap convenient and easy way to send a lot of data between sites and quite often at the bottoms of these towers is a cable that goes underground and you often will see they're all connected together with optic fiber so we have optic fiber cable then connecting into the system generally so safety is the next big thing we need to think about so workplace WHS work health and safety legislation requires every person in the workplace to ensure their own health and safety and the health and safety of each other so working with electricity has its own special hazards and these include the risk of electric shock so before starting any electrical work we need to identify all the hazards we then need to assess the risk associated with these of those hazards and then determine the method of dealing with all the identified risks and we can present that in this nice circular management diagram so let's have a closer look at the diagram number one is identify the hazard so this one would be about listing off all the possible hazards with the task that we've been given to do then the next thing is we have to think about are there any regulations or advisory standards that may impact what we're doing so in the electrical industry we have at the very top of the system an Australian standard for electrical work that's called AS3000 then we have state service rules so so state service rules then you could quite often might have industry rules as well so let's say you're doing some work for BHP in Wollongong you would have to uh, make sure you abide by the Australian standard rules the New South Wales service rules and BHP's own industrial rules then once you've done all that you've got to identify um, you've identified your hazards then you've got to assess the risks so you've got to decide for each hazard what's the risk so is the risk uh, a high risk is it medium is it low and one that people often forget is what are the consequences what are the consequences so the risk may be medium but the consequences could be very high or the risk could be a very high risk of something happening 
but the consequence might be reasonably low. So then, step three, we need to decide what the control measure will be. We might be stripping cable, for example. So we decide one of our control measures will be to wear gloves. So we're going to wear some gloves. We might be going to make sure the knife that we're going to use is nice and sharp. So strong handles. A good safe scabbard in which to keep it when you're not using it. All of these things would become under this topic of deciding the control measures. A control measure might be good training in how to use the knife to make sure you always cut away from yourself. So, training. Could be part of the control measure. Then once you have decided what the control measures will be, we then actually have to implement them. Actually do it. So, put a new sharp knife in your Stanley knife, a new sharp blade. Make sure you have got and put on your gloves. It's one thing to say we're going to wear and use gloves, but not actually do it. So you've actually got to implement the control measure. Then as the work continues and at the end of the day, monitor and review. So as the work is going on during the day, you're constantly monitoring, am I still protected? Then at the end of the day, you might sit back and review and say, well, we use the gloves but they were very large, bulky gloves, and it really slowed our work down. So we might want to use some thinner, but just as strong, more appropriate gloves the next time we do this task. So again, monitor and review. And of course, that brings us back to the beginning of the process. So again, identify the hazard, assess what the risk is, decide how you're going to control the risk, actually implement the risk by doing it and then monitor and review as you go and the process starts all over again. So let's move into sustainable energy. So applying sustainable energy principle means minimizing damage to the environment. Sustainable energy principles include anything that affects the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Sustainable energy is made up of two big parts, renewable energy and energy efficiency. So we have environmental laws that require many industries to have environmental management plans. So again, any large industry you're working for or working with will have an environmental management plan and you need to be aware of where it's found and what it says. So here's some environmental incidents. On the left hand side you can see a power pole with a transformer. Now the transformer is an oil based transformer and it's been knocked down by a car accident by the look of it and it has spilt its oil into the gutter and the roadway and it looks like someone has sprinkled some sawdust or some absorptive material to soak up the oil so uh, when they come to clean up, all they've got to do is shovel up the absorptive material and they take the oil with it. So the oil in the transformer is mineral oil. It's not particularly toxic uh, to humans or animals, but in large quantities in concentrated places it can be. Uh, so you know it could easily damage a frog's environment if it was to get into some of the waterways. So again, these are some of the uh, downsides of oil in transformers, and there's an example. On the right-hand side, you can see a pad mount transformer, and it's on fire. Here, the problem is poisonous gases from the plastics and the insulating materials. So the outside of the transformer cover is made of fiberglass, and while it burns, it will put off some pretty toxic, horrible poisonous gas, and also the insulating materials inside 
from which the transformer is made when they catch on fire, they also put out some pretty noxious gases. So, industrial organisations will have environmental management plans, as I've mentioned, which sets out a way of ensuring the organisation's activities will have an Im a minimum impact on the environment. For example, if a job involves digging a trench to lay a cable, the fill taken from the trench must be stored so it cannot run off into local streets and drains into the stormwater system. This could mean building a sediment fence around the dirt pile to prevent runoff during rain. A particular environmental health and hazard is asbestos, often used in the wall and cladding of old buildings. Others include oil spillage, chemical waste spillage, or anything that enters the water storm system. It's illegal to discharge anything other than clean water into our stormwater systems. Electricity suppliers will also have environmental incident management plans to deal with the many potential situations that could occur and pose a threat to the environment. Waste disposal is a particular issue for the electrotechnology industry. Due to the widespread use of batteries, computers, electronic equipment, oils, chemicals and other environmentally unfriendly stuff. Because these items are toxic to the environment, they cannot be disposed of as landfill. In general, suitable energy practices refers to the adopting of a lifestyle and work habits that enable and prevent, sorry, pre present generations to meet the needs while maintaining a healthy environment for future generations. Sustainable energy involves technologies that are helping make this possible, in which electric power is now being increasingly produced from renewable energy sources. These include solar, wind, heat, light, hydro, ocean wave and tidal energy systems, and also biofuels such as ethanol derived from sugar. So what about now efficiency? Energy efficiency is equally as important where the aim is to use less energy for the same outcome. Products that do this include energy efficient lamps such as compact fluorescent lamps and light emitting diodes and domestic products given high efficiency ratings. New buildings now have to conform to a set of standards to reduce energy and water usage. As I mentioned, I work mostly in New South Wales. So in New South Wales, this is known as BASIX or Bay 6. Other states and territories have similar legislations. So you can see here on our picture, over time, we've moved from the incandescent lamp which only actually had about a 6% efficiency to the compact fluorescent lamp, which had about a 70% efficiency up to now the LED light, which is getting up to about 95% efficiency. So here's the end of lesson one, part A. I hope you've enjoyed your lesson.